And so now you see what I'm up against. Right. Now you see what the protagonist of my novel is up against as he is enlisted to read a screenplay for a movie called The Hamlet. Not Hamlet, just The Hamlet. And it is an epic Vietnam War movie. And what I'm going to read from it takes place after he's read the screenplay. I'm not going to tell you the story because if you've seen these clips, you basically know what the story is going to be about. And he's uh, meeting the famous director of this movie for the first time who goes only by the name of the auteur. <laughs> and what, you need, what else do you need to know? He, the, our protagonist is half Asian. His father is a uh, French priest. His mother is a poor Vietnamese woman. And when he was in the Vietnamese, South Vietnamese military, he was a secret policeman. So he reads the screenplay. The screenplay was mailed to me by the director's personal assistant. The thickish manila envelope arriving with my name misspelled in a beautifully cursive hand. That was the first whiff of trouble. The second being had a personal assistant, Violet, did not even bother to say hello or goodbye when she called for my mailing information and to arrange for a meeting with the director in his Hollywood Hills home. When Violet opened the door, she continued with her bewildering manner of discourse in person. Glad to see you could make it. Heard a lot about you. Loved your notes on The Hamlet. And that's precisely how she spoke, trimming pronouns and periods as if punctuation and grammar were wasted on me. Then, without deigning to make eye contact, she inclined her head in a gesture of condescension and disdain, signaling me to enter. When I crossed over the threshold into the marble foyer, I instantly suspected that the cause of her behavior was my race. What she saw when she looked at me must have been my yellowness, my slightly smaller eyes, and the shadow cast by the ill fame of the Oriental's genitals, those supposedly minuscule privates <laughs> disparaged on many a public restroom wall by semi-literates. I might have been just half an Asian, but in America, it was all or nothing when it came to race. You were either white or you weren't. Was I just being paranoid, that all-American characteristic? Maybe Violet was stricken with colorblindness, the willful inability to distinguish between white and any other color, the only infirmity Americans wished for themselves. But as she advanced along the polished bamboo floors, steering clear of the dusky maid vacuuming a Turkish rug, I just knew it could not be so. The flawlessness of my English did not matter. Even if she could hear me, she still saw right through me or perhaps saw someone else instead of me. Her retinas burned with the images of all the castrati dreamed up by Hollywood to steal the place of real Asian men. Here, I speak of those cartoons named Fu Manchu, Charlie Chan, Number One Son, Hop Singh, Hop Singh, and the buck-tooth bespectacled Jap not so, not so much played as mocked by Mickey Rooney in Breakfast at Tiffany's. By the time I sat down opposite the director in his office, I was seething from the memory of all these previous wounds, although I did not show it. Still, I was flummoxed by having read a screenplay whose greatest special effect was neither the blowing up of various things nor the evisceration of various bodies, but the achievement of narrating a movie about our country where not a single one of our countrymen had an intelligible word to say. Violet has scraped my already chafed ethnic sensitivity even further, but since it would not do to make my irritation evident, I forced myself to smile and do what I did best, remaining as unreadable as a paper package wrapped up with string. The auteur studied me, this extra who had crept into the middle of his perfect mise-en-scene. A golden Oscar statuette exhibited itself to the side of his telephone, serving either as a kingly scepter or a mace for braining impertinent screenwriters. A hirsute shell of manliness 
ruffled along his forearms and from the collar of his shirt, reminding me of my own relative hairlessness, my chest and stomach and buttocks as streamlined as a Ken doll. Great to meet you, the auteur began. Loved your notes. How about something to drink? Coffee, tea, water, soda, scotch. Never too early for scotch. Violet, some scotch. Ice. I said ice. No ice then. Me too. Always neat for me. Look at my view. No, not at the gardener. Jose! Jose! Got to pound on the glass to get his attention. He's half deaf. Jose, move! You're blocking the view. Good. See the view. I'm talking about the Hollywood sign right there. Never get tired of it. Like the word of God just dropped down, plumped on the hills, and the word was Hollywood. <laughs> Didn't God say, let there be light first? What's a movie with light? Can't have a movie without light. And then words. See, that sign reminds me to write every morning. What? All right. So it doesn't say Hollywood. You got me. Good eye. Things falling to pieces. One O's half fallen, and the other O's fallen all together. The word's gone to shit. So what? You still get the meaning. Thanks, Violet. Cheers. How do they say it in your country? I said, how do they say it? Yo, 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 is it? I like that. Easy to remember. Yo, 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 then. And here's to the congressman for sending you my way. You're the first Vietnamese I've ever met. Not too many of you in Hollywood. Hell, none of you in Hollywood. And authenticity's important. Not that authenticity beats imagination. The story still comes first. The universality of the story has to be there. But it doesn't hurt to get the details right. I had a Green Beret who actually fought with the Montagnards vet the script. He found me. He had a screenplay. Everyone has a screenplay. He can't write, but he's a real American hero. Two tours of duty killed VC with his bare hands. You should have seen the Polaroids he showed me. Made my stomach turn. Gave me some ideas, though, for how to shoot the movie. Hardly had any corrections to make. What do you think of that? It took me a moment to realize he was asking me a question. I was disoriented, as if I were an English as a second language speaker, listening to an equally foreign speaker from another country. <laughs> That's great, I said. <laughs> you bet it's great. You, on the other hand, you wrote me another screenplay in the margins. You ever even read a screenplay before? It took me another moment to realize there was another question. Like Violet, he had a problem with conventional punctuation. No, I didn't think so. So why do you think, but you didn't get the details right. I didn't get the details right. Violet, hear that. I researched your country, my friend. I read Joseph Budinger and Francis Fitzgerald. Have you read Joseph Budinger and Francis Fitzgerald? He's the foremost historian on your little part of the world. And she won the Pulitzer Prize. She dissected your psychology. I think I know something about you people. His aggressiveness flustered me. And my flustering, which I was not accustomed to, only flustered me further, which was my only explanation for my forthcoming behavior. You didn't even get the screams right, I said. <laughs> Excuse me. I waited for an interjection until I realized he was just interrupting me with a question. All right, I said, my string starting to unravel. If I remember correctly, pages 26, 42, 58, 77, 91, 103, and 118. Basically, all the places in the script where one of my people has a speaking part, he or she screams. No words, just screams. So you should at least get the screams right. Screams are universal. Am I right, Violet? You're right, she said from where she sat next to me. Screams are not universal, I said. If I took this telephone cord and wrapped it around your neck and pulled it tight until your eyes bugged out and your tongue turned black, Violet's scream would sound very different from the scream 
you would be trying to make. <laughs> Those are two very different kinds of terror coming from a man and a woman. The man knows he is dying. The woman fears she is likely to die soon. Their situations and their bodies produce a qualitatively different timber. One must listen to them carefully to understand that while pain is universal, it is also utterly private. We cannot know whether our pain is like anybody else's pain until we talk about it. Once we do that, we speak and think in ways cultural and individual. In this country, for example, someone fleeing for his life will think he should call for the police. This is a reasonable way to cope with the threat of pain. But in my country, no one calls for the police, since it is often the police who inflict the pain. Am I right, Violet? Violet mutely nodded her head. <laughs> so, let me just point out that in your script, you have my people scream the following way. <laughs> <laughs> For example, <laughs> when villager number three <laughs> is impaled by a Viet Cong punji trap, this is how he screams. Or when the little girl sacrifices her life to alert the Green Berets to the Viet Cong sneaking into the village, this is how she screams before her throat is cut. But having heard many of my countrymen screaming in pain, I can assure you, this is not how they scream. Would you like to hear how they scream? His Adam's apple bobbed as he swallowed. Okay. I stood up and leaned on the desk to look right into his eyes. But I didn't see him. What I saw was the face of the wiry Montagnard an elder of the Brew minority, who lived in an actual hamlet, not far from the setting of this movie. Rumor had it he served as a liaison agent for the Viet Cong. I was on my first assignment as a lieutenant and could not figure out a way to save the man from my captain wrapping a strand of rusted barbed wire around his throat. The necklace tight enough so that each time he swallowed, the wire tickled it's Adam's apple. That was not what made the old man scream, however. It was just the appetizer. In my mind, though, as I watched the scene, I screamed for him. Here's what it sounds like, I said, reaching across the desk to pick up the auteur's fountain pen. I wrote, automatopoetically, across the cover page, of the screenplay in big black letters. <laughs> then I capped his pen, put it back on his leather writing pad, and said, That's how we scream in my country. Thank you. Yeah.